Okay, hello everybody. You know, today I'm wearing my Fiji rugby shirt and it has nothing to do with this episode of Fun with Maps except the last picture we're going to show, which you'll see the Fiji con connection. It's really cool. So, uh, the Fiji rugby team, as you may know, won the last two gold medals in the Olympics. So this is one of my favorite shirts and there it is. But anyway, this is a special episode of Fun with Maps. You know, you may remember... Um, from geography class some of these terms but this could be a refresher course or it could be a first time you've heard some of them. I'm your host Dan Hansen and this Fun With Maps episode we're going to talk about longitude and latitude and Greenwich Mean Time and the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn and things like that just maybe you don't know about or maybe you just need a refresher on. So latitude and longitude. Any point on the globe can be identified by two coordinates, their latitude and their longitude. So if a, a ship's captain or a pilot or someone like that wants to specify where they are or where they're going, they can use these coordinates of longitude and latitude. And on a world map like this, you can see, you know, the latitude are the, the lines parallel to the equator. Okay, so here's the equator. And then you've got these other lines here, and they'll be labeled, like here's 30 degrees, here's 50 degrees, minus 30, minus 50. Latitude goes that way, and it divides the Earth into uh, northern and southern hemispheres. So we know that the equator in the middle here, that's zero. But what about longitude? Here's the longitude lines. You can see them. They're coming around, and... You know, let's look at the globe. It might get a little little better perspective there. So here we, we've got a sphere. The Earth is a sphere, or a spheroid is pretty close. And you've got these lines of longitude here. So here's a line, they call those meridians. Just like the, the latitude lines are called parallels, because they're parallel to the equator. These lines of longitude are meridians. And here you have one, and its backside, the other side of it that connects at the bottom, that's its anti-meridian. So you've got lines of longitude or meridians, and to connect the other side to the anti-meridian or longitude. So, like I say, just by definition, we know the equator is zero because that's just how the Earth is. But longitude, there's nothing defined like that with longitude. So, people got together and decided on what zero, what zero longitude or the prime meridian would be, okay? So, and we'll see in the, the episode a little later why they chose this, but they chose Greenwich, England, up here as the zero point of longitude. So this line here is zero longitude, okay? And, okay, we think Greenwich, you know, it goes through England, but it goes through other places too. Look at, here's Greenwich, but it goes through France and Spain and Algeria and Mali and Burkina Faso and Ghana, and then it goes all the way down through here to Antarctica. So that is zero longitude. This is zero latitude. They meet about there, as we'll see in a, a better map pretty soon. Okay, so you can tell any point, like I say, on the Earth by their coordinates. So for example, uh, let's, let me read some of these. So when we're here, in, in, actually Greenwich, which is just outside of London, in Kent, um, just outside of London, England. Okay, there's a Royal Observatory there, and hundreds of thousands of visitors go there every year just so they can stand at the zero point. Okay, so, but some of these other numbers, um, for example, the latitude of Paris, France is, let's see, about 48.8 and the longitude is 2 point something. So you can see, here's zero, the equator, so you can see it goes, there's 30, so it goes up to 48. And since it's so close here to Greenwich, it's zero, it's only two. So here's New York over here and that's about 40 by 73. So it's about the same latitude as, as Paris. Beijing over here, um, it's about 40 with a longitude of 116, so it's far east there. And Tokyo's up here, and, and Seoul, Korea, and we'll see about the 38th parallel soon, too. 
Now, when we get to something like Brazil, this is interesting. Because it's below the equator, the numbers will change a little. So, Rio de Janeiro here, uh, it's minus 22.9 latitude. So, it's below the equator, so it's minus. Sometimes they'll use the term 22.9 south. And the longitude is minus 43. Okay? So, because there is southern hemisphere here, they use either north, south, east, or west. Usually up here we just, we don't use the north. So we can see all these lines of longitude, these lines of latitude, makes a lot of sense, but there's other things in uh, just linked to this. The Greenwich Mean Time, all our time zones are linked to this, and you've heard of terms like the Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, we're going to get into that more. But up here, Tropic of Cancer, down here, Tropic of Capricorn, and of course you have the equator there, prime meridian. So there's some interesting things with that. One fun with maps fact about the Tropic of Capricorn. Remember this map when I tell you that fact later. Here's the Tropic of Cancer. Okay. So there's a lot of interesting things with latitude and longitude and the tropics and Greenwich Mean Time and all. So let's start this episode of Fun with Maps. So here's a drawing of it's a perspective view of the Earth, or any sphere really, showing how latitude and longitude are defined on a spherical model. And the graticule spacing is 10 degrees. So by graticule, we just mean the, that network of lines, the uh, parallels and the meridians and all. So, like I say, the math is very complicated, but, uh, you know, if you're into that, it, it's, it's fascinating to do, but we're not going to touch on that your fun with maps. So as I said, latitude is an angle which ranges from zero at the equator, okay, it's the equator, to 90 degrees north or south at the poles, okay. So up here it's a 90 degree angle, right here it's zero. Actually there are two angles measured in degrees, minutes of arc, and seconds of arc. So you might see something like 35, 43, 9, which means an angle of 35 degrees, 43 minutes, and 9 seconds. Don't be confused when you see the uh, apostrophe in the quote mark. It's not a notation for feet and inches. This is the degrees and arcs, uh, minutes, and seconds, okay? A degree contains 60 minutes of arc, and a minute contains 60 seconds of arc. There's a lot of math, like I say, that goes into term these, these coordinates, but we're going to skip all that. But let's look at a very brief history here. So here's a drawing of Ptolemy using uh, an instrument called a quadrant back in 1564. So throughout history, people, men, women, scientists have been trying to um, navigate the globe. And that's where the latitude and longitude came about. So in 1492, you have Columbus crossing the Atlantic. They could measure latitude because they observed the pole star, okay, and they could do that. But there's no way, a reliable way, of measuring a ship's longitude once you're out of sight of land. So the charts were inaccurate and incomplete. Much of the world was uh, still unexplored, though. But as trade routes opened up, it became increasingly urgent to find a solution to the problem of determining longitude. So the maritime nations of Europe got together and offered a variety of large rewards or prizes to the scientists and the person who came up with a, a solution to the problem. So, each 15 degrees of longitude is equivalent to a difference in time of one hour. So there's a connection with time and longitude here. So in theory then, if you wanted to find out how far east or west you are from your homeland, all a sailor had to do was determine his local time from, and that could be from observing the sun or the stars, and compare it with the time back home at the same moment. But in the 1500s, how would a sailor know the time back home? You know, you couldn't look on your cell phone or connect. So they thought of taking a clock to sea, but even that was too ina inaccurate to be of use. Um, when they got the pendulum clock in 1615, 1657, that made some improvements, um, actually substantial improvements, and revolutionized uh, positional astronomy. But on a, bo a moving ship, you know, a pendulum would beat irregularly and sometimes it would stop. So it wasn't the best solution. You know, the pendulum couldn't be tossed around on a ship. It's really a fascinating study to see how um, 
humankind progressed and, and was able to come up with the, these measurements. Here's a picture of a sextant, one of the instruments they used. Um, I encourage you to research this more if you like this kind of stuff. It's fascinating. You know, sailors used the moon as a clock, and then they developed these tools like the quadrant and the sextant here and the chronometer and more of that stuff. This is a, the earliest known pendulum clock design uh, for about 1641 um, by Galileo. At least he gets credit. Some say it was his son. Some say it was his instrument maker because by 1641 Galileo was pretty much blind. But his design and this is the first uh, pendulum clock. Um, here's the fun with maps fact. In 1610, not long after the invention of the telescope, Galileo discovered the four largest moons of Jupiter. Okay. He and others soon observed that eclipses of the moons occurred at what appeared to be regular intervals, and they suggested the difference in time between the observed and predicted time of occurrence at a standard meridian would enable longitude differences to be measured. So, in 1616, Galileo submitted this method to the Spanish. He thought he would have, had won the award. He was going to get the reward money. But... Uh, they didn't see the merits of it and they he, he didn't win the award so the Dutch later offered a prize for the finding the longitude and uh, he went to them with his idea but again it was unsuccessful he never got that award so you know fast forward and, and there's been lots of experiments and scientific advancements so in 1884 there was an international meridian conference and they met to settle on a prime meridian for the world okay and since at the time uh, more sailors were measuring their longitude from Greenwich, Greenwich, um, just in Kent, and a little uh, outside of, of London, than anywhere else, uh, they voted on making Greenwich the prime meridian or the initial meridian for longitude, and that was adopted in the vote by 22 governments who supported it, one opposed, and two abstained. So really the, devotion, the definition of zero degrees longitude was arbitrary. It came down to a vote. It could have been anywhere. Here's a fun with maps fact. If you remember one of our early episodes when we were doing a uh, North Africa maps, um, we told you that the intersection point of the prime meridian, which is zero degrees longitude, and the equator, zero degrees latitude, is in the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Guinea about 400 miles south of the Republic of Ghana on the west coast of Africa. And this point of intersection exists, obviously, but its exact location, it's more conventional. It's, it's not like there's a, a landmark there or something. So if you look, so here's the UK and London, and if you go down, okay, here's zero, longitude, here's the equator, zero latitude. So right about here, we say about 400 miles south of the Republic of Ghana, that's where zero zero is, and that's uh, uh, zero latitude and zero longitude. So you've probably heard in your history classes at least of the 38th parallel, okay? And the 38th parallel north is just that circle of latitude that is 38 degrees north of the Earth's equator. So here's 36, here's 38, okay? 38th parallel. Okay, so here we have it crossing Korea, but it also crosses Europe, the Mediterranean, Asia, Pacific Ocean, North America, the Atlantic Ocean, all that, because it goes all around the globe. But what's interesting about the 38th parallel that you may have heard of, um, that formed the border between North and South Korea prior to the Korean War. So here you've got Seoul, here's Pyongyang up here, here's uh, 38th parallel, and that's North Korea, that's South Korea. Now, where I'm from, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, the latitude is 41 north, longitude is 81. So we're a little north of the 38th parallel. In, in the U.S., a um, city like Louisville, Kentucky would be on the 38th parallel. So here are some other uh, connected terms you may have heard about. Um, this is, you know, it's showing the relationship of Earth's tilt on its axis to some of these circles but what I want to show you from this map is the five major circles of latitude that make up uh, the marks of the earth so we've got the equator you all know right in the middle then we've got the arctic circle up here 
which we saw with the North Pole. We've got the Antarctic Circle down here. And then we've got these other two, these tropics, the Tropic of Cancer to the north of the equator and the Tropic of Capricorn here. Okay, those are the five major circles of latitude. So the Tropic of Cancer, okay, this line here, um, it's also referred to as the Northern Tropic. It's the most northerly circle of latitude on Earth at which the sun could be directly overhead. Okay? And when that happens is in the June solstice. So, you know, in June sometimes when we have the solstice, that's when the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun to its maximum extent. Okay? That's right here. Here's the sun, obviously not the scale. And we're tilted here, the maximum that the Earth is going to do that. And there's a Tropic of Cancer, okay? And the, uh, the solar midnight in the December solstice, okay, it'll reach 90 degrees below the horizon at solar midnight. So, you know, there, it, the numbers actually evolve, but it's basically about 23... Uh, degrees north of the equator. That's the Tropic of Cancer. Now it's got a, a counterpart in the southern hemisphere. That's the Tropic of uh, Capricorn and that marks the most southerly position which the Sun could be directly overhead. So here it's far from the Sun in, in June which for us, us in the northern hemisphere were closest and here in December they're closest. Okay. So this is a fun with maps fact. In the geopolitical world, the Tropic of Cancer, okay, it's known for being the southern limitation on the mutual defense obligation of NATO. So, so as member states of NATO are not obligated to come to the defense of territory below the Tropic of Cancer. Isn't that something? So here's a road sign. Uh, it's actually in the Western Sahara. Uh, marks the Tropic of of cancer, you know, not very impressive or anything. Um, it's it's actually Tropic of Cancer in English, and this is Rock Torito. This is in Hungarian because the group um, that placed it there was was uh, from a Budapest Bamako rally. So here's the Tropic of Cancer in Western Sahara, and it'll go, you know, across the whole globe. So where did these names come from? Well, when they named um, you know, back in the BC, um, they named this line of latitude. The sun at that time was in the constellation Cancer, or in Latin would be crab, at the June solstice. So, um, and of course, the solstice is the time each year that the sun reaches its zenith at this latitude. So, since the, uh, the sun was in the constellation Cancer there, they called it the Tropic of Cancer. And, you know, these things evolve. This is no longer the case. Actually, today the sun is in Taurus at the June solstice. So, if they were changing that, they'd call it the Tropic of Taurus, but um, it stayed the Tropic of Cancer. And the word tropic itself comes from the Greek word trope, meaning turn, like change of direction or circumstances or incl inclination. Retur it refers to the fact that the sun appears to turn back at the solstices. Okay. Now remember in a previous episode of Fun with Maps, the one on the North Pole, we told you about the Earth's wobble. So because of this, for example, the Tropic of Cancer's position is not fixed, it constantly changes because of the slight wobble in the Earth's longitudinal alignment relative to the, uh, the ecliptic, the plane in which the Earth orbits around the Sun. So that's why you'll have um, signs like this, but this will actually change over time and uh, there's some places on Earth where they We'll date it and show how it's how it's moved along. Let's go back to that oh. other map. The wobble of the Earth means that, for example, the Tropic of Cancer is this latitude line here. It's currently drifting southward at a rate of about almost almost 50 feet per year. So, in 1917, it was exactly 23 degrees 27 minutes north. And in the year 2045, it's going to be at 23 degrees, 26 minutes north. So, wobble of the Earth, and there is changes there. Now, the dis distance between, like, the Arctic Circle or Antarctic Circle and the Tropic of Cancer, you know, that's going to be essentially constant 
because they'll move in tandem even though you know that's counting on the equator not having that wobble and it does some but it's it's pretty essentially they're in tandem so the tropic of capricorn here you can guess it you know the sun was in capricorn at the time there um here's a, a fascinating fun with maps fact in the year 2000 more than half of the world's population lived north of the tropic of cancer and you can't really tell from this map but you know um, north of that that would include United States Europe a good chunk of Asia you know China not India not Southeast Asia not Australia not uh, the lower two-thirds of South America but um, so that half the world's population lived north of that Tropic of Cancer that's fascinating to me and here's another fun with maps fact you know if you want to uh, according to the Federation Aeronautics International Aeronautics Federation if you want to compete for a world speed record you know around the world speed record you've got to cover distance of at least the length of the Tropic of Cancer you've got to cross all the meridians and you got to end at the same airfield where you start so currently the length of the Tropic of Cancer is about uh, 22,859 miles so there's two important concepts related to latitude and especially longitude um, local time and universal time this is a CIA map of the world time zones okay um, local time it's just a measure of the position of the sun relative to the locality so at noon the sun passes to the south and is furthest from the horizon in your locality somewhere around 6 a.m. it rises somewhere around 6 p.m. it sets so local time is what we use uh, you know to regulate our lives and when we get up when we eat when we work all that stuff but if we wanted to have some consistent uh, time for like an astronomical event like when a, uh, a supernova was detected or something we need a single agreed, clock, agreed upon clock you know we have to mark the time worldwide not tied to our own locality and that's what's called universal time UT which is defined as the local time in Greenwich England at the zero meridian so so here we are at zero right and longitudes are measured from 180 to the east and uh, 180 to the west okay or sometimes they call it minus 180 so both of those longitudes share the same line in the middle of the Pacific Ocean so it, it's not real clear on this map but 180 east 180 west they meet in the Pacific Ocean so this is cool now so as the earth rotates around its axis at any moment one line of longitude the noon meridian will face the Sun and that that moment it'll be noon everywhere on it so after 24 hours the earth is undergoing a full rotation with respect to the Sun and the same meridian again faces noon thus each hour the earth rotates by 360 degrees over 24 or 15 degrees again I want to stay away from the math but it's pretty cool so what that means is um, when at your location at your house it's noon 15 degrees to the east the time is 1 p.m. because the meridian faced the Sun an hour ago on the other hand 15 degrees to the west is just 11 a.m. because in an hour's time that meridian will face the Sun and experience its own noon okay you're following this okay so in the middle of the 19th century each community across the United States defined its own local time um, by which the Sun on average reached the farthest point from the horizon for that day at noon okay so here's a time zone map of the United States 1913 and you'll notice there's very different uh, it's very different than it is today so here I am in Cleveland Ohio and we're actually in the same time zone today as New York and Chicago's in a different one but in this map Cleveland and Chicago are in the same and New York is in a different so it's 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 changed so what happened was travelers crossing the US by train had to readjust their watches at every city basically long-distance telegraph operators had to coordinate their times there is confusion so the railroad companies decide to adopt time zones and these are now zones about 15 degrees wide 
which observed the same local time, but they differed by an hour from their neighboring zones. And soon the nation adopted this as a whole. Okay? So that's how we came up with our time zones. And here's the fun with maps fact. So the continental U.S. has four main time zones, eastern, central, mountain, and western. Several more for Alaska, Hawaii, the Aleut Islands, and all. Canadian provinces east of Maine, they're on Atlantic time. Other countries of the world have their own time zones. They decide. Only Saudi Arabia uses local times, and that's because of uh, religious considerations. So here's something you may have wondered about, and I hope we can explain it. So suppose it's noon where you are, and you proceed west. And suppose you could travel instantly to wherever you wanted to, okay? So you don't have to worry about that. So it's noon. Here you are. 15 degrees to the west, it's 11 a.m. Another 15 degrees, so 30 degrees total, it's 10 a.m. 45 degrees, it's 9 a.m., and so on. If you keep this up, when you get 180 degrees away, it'll be midnight, okay? Still further west, it's the previous day. This way, by the time we've covered 360 degrees, the full circle, and we've come back to where we are, the time should be noon again, but it's yesterday noon, okay? So, you know, you're saying, wait a minute, you can't travel from today to the same time yesterday, but you can. And this is where we got into trouble, because longitude determines only the hour of the day, not the date. That's determined separately. So, the International Date Line was established to avoid this sort of problem. Most of it follows the 180th meridian, where, again, it's, uh, we can't see it good on this map, by common agreement, um, Whenever we cross it at the 180th meridian, the date advances one day going west or goes back one day going east. So that line passes the Bering Strait between Alaska okay, and Siberia. So they have different dates, but for most of its course, it runs in the middle of the Pacific Ocean here, and it kind of uh, juts around some of the islands so it doesn't inconvenience any local timekeeping. So let's wrap up uh, this episode with a fantastic photo from someone, I Plens, P L E N Z, who shared it in Creative Commons. This is a uh, a picture of a guy uh, at the 180 degree meridian, the International Date Line in Fiji, actually T Tavuni, Fiji, and you can see. I hope you can see this well. Over here to the west, it's today, and over here to the east it's yesterday so he's standing in between yesterday and today and that's just such a cool picture but I hope now you understand how this happens with latitude and longitude and and the date lines and all that so now you can see why I wore this Fiji shirt is that the coolest picture ever or what so I hope you learned something in this uh, episode of fun with maps or it had a good refresher course i always learn something from these and it's uh, it's a lot of fun doing it so if you liked it please click on like and if you never want to miss an episode of fun with maps click on subscribe in the lower right that way you won't miss one we've got some really good episodes coming up so until next time i'm your host dan hansen keep on having fun with maps